who was discovering Canyon City just south of us here. And like typical mining communities of the west, they had their own Chinatown there as well. When gold was discovered, it was from miners on their way up from California and Nevada to Idaho and Montana, camped on Canyon Creek, accidentally found gold from the town. Right behind them was the Chinese laborers and miners. Basically did the same thing, camped on the creek, found gold from the Chinatown. In 1866, that's when this building here was built, everyone assumed it was built by the Chinese. However, the newer information that we got last year has been confirmed it was built by the Dulles Military Road Company as part of Congress's legislation to improve trade and supply routes to the West Coast. So this was actually built as a little supply depot for them. By 1871, some Chinese laborers actually bought it, turned it into a general store, and named it Kamwa Chung and Company. That's still the original sign up there on the wall. By 1885, a couple things happened that year. First off, the Chinatown was in Canyon City, mysteriously burnt down, and the Chinese were not allowed to rebuild there. Instead, they were forced to come over here to this location and build right here. To give you an idea how large it was, the southern extent was right about where that green fence is to the south. Stand the west end of the city park, east where that street is that direction, northern extent right about where those houses are right now. Right about where those bike racks are is where a Chinese temple used to be, so what we actually walked down was the main street of the Chinatown. That meant in 1885 that there's about 2,000 Chinese immigrants living here, which made it the third largest Chinatown in the U.S., only after San Francisco and then Seattle or Portland, depending on which year you look at. Also during that same year is when we think Long An and Aim Dot Kate actually first met. They decided to go into business together and partner up and they bought Kamwa Chung and Company in 1888. And that's really when their story here begins. By 1910, most of the Chinese population had left. All the labor jobs from ranching, railroad, and mining were pretty much gone. So a lot of the Chinese either went back to Portland or even back to China at that point. By the 1930s, most of the Chinatown itself was gone. A couple things that happened is a fire came through, burnt down a few of the structures, including the Chinese temple, and then the John Day dredge looking for gold on the river pretty much buried the rest of Chinatown underneath all the tailing piles. In 1948, Doc Kay was still living here by himself. He fell, broke his hip, had to be taken to Portland to be mended. He thought he'd be back in a couple weeks. So he just locked the doors, locked the windows, and never came back. So the building sat vacant and not open for the next 20 plus years until the late 1960s. At that point, the city of John Day was going to develop the area and tear the building down. But one of the city council members said, well, maybe before we do that, we should see what's inside the building first. So they opened up the doors, saw what they saw, came back, we're going to make a museum. And that's where our story now begins. So at this point, we'll head inside the building here. We'll be playing a little audio tour once we get inside. And as you're waiting for me to unlock the door, feel free to go up onto the porch, looking through the screen, see how many bullet holes you can find, because there's still evidence from the racial tensions from the 1880s that's still there. And you know, also, if you wouldn't mind brushing your shoes off so we don't track the gravel in this sort of building, that would be greatly appreciated. Any questions before we head in? I thought uh, he had a nephew that was going to be trained in uh, Chinese Aqua. medicine and that the nephew actually deeded the property over or something like Correct. that, right? Yep. And I actually get into a little bit more of that towards okay. the end of the tour. So it kind of ties into all the estate history. That's all right. Like a huge chunk of that. Any other questions? Not at this time. Uh, all right. Not at this time. I'll meet you inside. Uh, or I'll meet you right here. Nineteen forty eight. So, right here is the main bullet holes we were referring to earlier. A lot of people question the intelligence of the Chinese. As most people know, tin is not necessarily the best material to stop bullets. But what their main concern was people throwing flammable objects to burn their buildings down. Mm -hmm. So, they put tin in, on their doors and windows to help prevent that. In this case, it's kerosene cans. They flatten out and put on there. Some point along the way, they also asked you to door doors for air protection here as well. 
Good when you go ahead and close the door. See where the bolts pass through anyway. So this is pretty much how the building looks like when they first opened up in the 1960s. But the only thing that really changed is it removed a lot of crates and boxes from the floor area so it can open up for folks to walk through. But other than that, everything you see is still in its place since 1948 when Dot K left. Including the fruit on the altar sands there in the corner. You missed this building. What was it? That it was Dot K's bedroom. Oh, it's a bedroom. Mm -hmm. So at this point, I'll go ahead and get the audio tour started. It's going to talk about the, give you a little brief introduction, talk about what the main room is used for, talk about Doc K's apothecary in this corner, and his bedroom over in the other corner. Any other questions before we get started? No, not at this time. All right, enjoy. Welcome to Cam Wa Chang. The doors you just entered are a gateway into the world of Ying Doc Hay and Long On, the Chinese immigrants who purchased this unique building in 1888. As the door is closed, let your eyes adjust to the relative darkness and take in everything around you. As you may have noticed on your way in, the front door has been pierced by bullets. A grim reminder of the hardships and racism endured by Chinese workers in America. The tin and steel plating, combined with steel accordion doors, kept Doc Hay, Lung On, and their visitors safe within the confines of Cam Wa Chang. Throughout your tour, look at all the details and items within the building. Epigrams, the red Chinese handwriting on the walls, the calendars, the books, the utensils, the shrines, they were all left in the building when Lung On and Doc Hay died. Kim Wa Chung is our home, our business, and our life. I walk in and see people lining the room. They come from all around to see the China doctor. For many, it is the first time they have been to Chinatown and Aang knows them all. The room you are standing in now was the waiting room for Doc Hay's medical practice. Patients, mostly non-Chinese, would have lined the small stools and chairs around the room waiting to be diagnosed by the China doctor, as he was known. The overstuffed red chair in the corner was the examination chair, and it was there that Doc diagnosed his patients using an ancient technique known as pulsology. By gently touching the hands and wrists of his patients, Doc Hay was able to make a diagnosis, a diagnosis he would then treat with more than 500 herbs, plants, minerals, and animal extracts. Go on top of the apothecary next. So many people come to see me. I give them medicines, herbs, and roots, and extracts from China. Many complain about the bad taste, but when they feel better, they say, Thank you, Dr. He. If you step toward the apothecary, notice just how many different tins, bottles, and drawers full of items were used to make Doc's medicines. For each diagnosis, he would combine various items, sometimes even snake alcohol or bear paw. He would then use a mortar and pestle or a coffee grinder to make a tea-like mixture that would then be steeped in hot water. Doc Hay was renowned throughout the West for his ability to heal people, but from most historical accounts, Almost everyone agreed that his medicines tasted absolutely awful and smelled even worse. As you look around the apothecary, also notice the many patent medicines of the time in the small bottles on the counter. Go we'll top bottle better next. My friend sleeps in this room. Every night, the same thing. Close away. Slippers away, winds the clock, he reads the letters from the trunk under the bed, 
every night on the same bed, content in his home in America. For 60 years, this small room was Doc's personal domain. Only he was allowed inside. Even though the room is sparsely decorated, the footlocker beneath his bed had over $23,000 in uncashed checks when he died. Many believe that he didn't cash them because his patients were too poor. And yet, his detailed patient records indicated that he treated them anyway. Also note the cleaver on the bedside table. Chinese immigrants were not allowed to own firearms. So, Doc slept with a meat cleaver at the ready during the racial tension of the late 19th century. Any questions at this point? Did he, did he ever smoke in their uh, opium or anything like that? Um, it appears like he may have. I think uh, Doc Hate did for sure. We're not sure about Wang An. But they certainly love their cigars, though, too. They like to smoke a lot of cigars. I wonder how long it took to dissipate the smell of cigars in here. <laughs> oh, when this lights up all we're long, you can still smell a little odor coming through. Yeah, it's all permeated throughout the whole walls and everything. To add with Doc Hayes' side of the story a little bit more, we actually had some special visitors uh, a year ago last August. It was a Chinese delegation that came through, consisting of five professors at universities in Hong Kong, Beijing, and Taiwan. They specialize in Chinese medicine, and they've been working on a project for the last 11 years or so, going around the world to different sites, gathering information about Chinese medicine. Because during their Cultural Revolution, all the information got lost and destroyed. So they've been tasked to try to piece it back together. Well, we were basically the last one on the list, because little John Day not going to have a lot here. Well, when they come over, they spend a couple hours in the apothecary, a couple hours in our archives. In our archives, we have about 20,000 documents that came out of this building. Most of it's still written in Cantonese Chinese, which is the writing that you see around you here. When they got done looking at it, they actually came back to us and said, we just want to let you know, of all the places that we've been to around the world, you have the largest intact collection that we've ever seen. They said a lot of the ingredients on here are still viable, could be used today. They said there's some ingredients they had no idea was actually being used in medicine. And they also say it's not only coming from China and Asia, but Central, South America, even Africa. Not to mention local ingredients here as well. And when they tied all this into all the paper records, the archives, because we have all Doc Hayes medical formulas, prescription records, and patient records, they said there's so much here that we need to go through. We go and um, get a hold of our colleagues and help with this research. But they uh, said there's so much here that already we believe that there's enough knowledge here to change our knowledge of the medical world, which is kind of a bold statement coming from them. They also said that we need to share this with our citizens in China because this is such a lost history to them. We feel we need to bring our citizens from China over here to John Day to visit their ancestors. I said, okay, that's fine. Well, a couple months later in October, I get a call from the Chamber of Commerce. They said, what are you doing over at Ken Wachong? I was like, well, what do you mean? Well, we've gotten 3,500 hits off our website from China in the last two months. What are you doing over there? So we told them about the professor's visit, and they actually had a special meeting in the spring. What are we going to do if we have thousands of Chinese tourists hitting John Day? It's something that they're concerned about, and they actually believe will be happening here in the next couple of years with everything else that's going on. Well, also the professor stated they were working on a documentary series about Chinese medicine. And because of what we have here, they want to include us on that project. And so they said they expect a phone call from the Discovery Channel in the next two to three years. Well, as an update to that, they actually uh, called on the first part of July. They said, we can't wait for the Discovery Channel. We want to send our own production crew over here at the end of the month. So they were actually over here about three weeks ago filming for um, their production company, which is basically the Chinese version of the Discovery Channel. And so they were here for three days filming. Well, what makes that really unique is that the professor that's leading all this, Professor Zhao, he actually is um, a major professor over in Chinese medicine in China. And he's also on numerous advisory and committees, um, anything to do with health and human services, that kind of stuff. 
He's also the director of his own museum on herbal medicine. And he sits on the tourism board for China. He says, I have 3 million followers on my website. And I want to tie this with all our tourist agencies in China. So they can come over here to John Day to visit Kanwa Chung. So, in the next year or two, we will definitely be getting a lot more interest from China, particularly. But also on top of that, Discovery Channel will probably be over here filming either the first part of next year, maybe in the spring, maybe the first part of summer. So once that happens, I know we will be getting a lot more visitors coming through. So, kind of an exciting, scary time over the next couple of years to see how all this all plays out with everything else that's going on. So... Good thing you're here today, because who knows about what's happening next year. <laughs> right, right. I'm kind of thinking on the order of um, how the town is going to gear up for uh, an international type of uh, visitor. They're not exact. I mean, that's part of the reason why um, they're so on board with us taking over the city park and helping with that with the new rec center that they're planning. Because there's a scene where things are going on with Ken Wa Chung and how we can kind of draw in people to John Day. So now they need to say, okay, what else can we provide people once they get here? And so that's kind of be the story. Like, we're obviously going to need another motel if this is all happening on because there's not enough lodging in the first place. So there's a lot of moving parts over the next couple, three years to see how this all goes because we're wanting to get moved into the new visitor center here in about three years because that is when our lease runs out for the building we're at now. So a lot of things happening, and all this happening all at once. Right. It's all right here. And so that means we need to figure out, okay, how are we going to accommodate more visitors? Can we accommodate more visitors? Can we accommodate tour buses, loads of people? How can we do this? Translations of everything. Uh, it's just, because right now we're still, we're internationally known, because we're getting so many people from Europe, the Netherlands, that area. It's just a lot of buildup over the last year or so with everything else going on. Well, I can kind of tell you about tourists because I worked at Hoover Dam and what they would do for non-English speaking people is that they'd have a, a transmitter and they'd give them a wand and then the wand was like a receiver and then it was tuned to different frequencies and the different languages would be on different frequencies and then they could walk around as they pleased and care about things so I, I, you may need to stop by again to try to see what we can do about because that was the kind of thing i was like it was like i mean we can hire translators but we don't know when they would be coming and we gotta have two weeks notice a lot right. of times you may not get that right no so, it, that'd be great yeah no and it's like basically you have a, a unit that broadcasts it just like what mm -hmm. you had here but it's broadcast in their own language and then they have their wand and you know they can basically listen to you know what it says do you know where where they get that from where they i can it? inquire i can inquire. i would love to find something like that because that's kind of what i've been thinking about for the last couple of weeks since they've been here because right. we need to have not only for chinese but a lot of the netherlands and swedish people are coming through they can't barely speaking english right so if we had something there where they can actually hear it while everyone else is hearing the english version that would be that right. would be great yeah that save us a lot of headaches okay well you have a web address and you know i'll research it out and sure be in touch i'll, with I'll you. even give you one of my cards okay so okay direct email to me. So one other thing to point out before we go on the long on is I talked about the cleaver in his bedroom right there. Right. Because of the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act, they were not allowed to own firearms. So they used cleavers for about everything every day. So it makes natural sense to use it for defense as well. So my question to you folks is, do you think Doc Hay actually ever used it for defense? Well, he probably did several times on several occasions. But uh, was it, it was his partner who was the popular guy, right? Leon. Leon. But or, or they called him Leon, right? Leon. Yeah. Sure. Okay. See, I've been trying to do my research too be, good, before coming good. down here, um, but I would suspect that he probably had because people get intoxicated and 
it being race related and all that, you sure. know. And you thought? He's asking you, sweetie. Oh. Do you think that he had to use it only for chopping ducks? I don't want my voice on that. <laughs> <laughs> So, in 2006, we actually had oral histories done from the local town folks about their knowledge of, Doug, of Long Island and Doc K. We had one gentleman come through and recount a story. When he was much younger, he and some friends were very curious of what was inside the building. This is at a time Doc K lived here by himself. So, one night, they did break in through the front door, took a couple steps in. Next thing they knew, the meat cleaver whizzed by their heads, hit the wall, and they bolted out. And they told everyone in town, don't go in the Doc Hayes building because they'll throw the meat cleaver at you. Well, it kind of brings up three separate points with this little story. First off, we actually have an account of him using it for defense. Second point is, when he was throwing it, he did not know where he was throwing it because he was actually blind. Very few people knew he had poor eyesight when he got here to John Day. And by 1940, he was almost completely blind. And very few people were aware of that. Third point is that when you have the younger generation telling stories about meat cleavers being thrown at them, and then the older generation that knew Long Island and Doc K and respected them from being members of the community, it goes a long ways why this building was never vandalized during that 20 year period. We do know it got broken into a couple times by local kids looking for fireworks, but even they admitted they thought they were hearing noises, one person thought they heard a voice, and they wanted no part of that, so they left. So now you can imagine what would have happened if the sea opened up the door, come in, and everything's gone, destroyed, we wouldn't be here today. So in a lot of ways, the cleaver is still protecting the building through the stories it has passed on. Because everyone thought it was haunted, and they avoided it like the plague. Any questions before going on the way on? He would, he would probably be very pleased at knowing that he's being honored in his afterlife. Oh, I think so. He'd probably get a yeah. big kick out of it. Probably so. It's just like, why didn't this happen during the time that I was living? <laughs> right. Yeah, uh, sure. All right, we're here a little bit about one on the side of things. Long on has a mind for business. I heal people, and he sells them food and tobacco and runs the games at night. He takes care of all the money. The area to the back of the room was Long On's domain. As the businessman of the two, he was ever in search of a money-making venture. The general store was well-stocked with necessities, household goods, food items, and imported Chinese products, although alcohol and tobacco were best sellers. In addition to supplies, Long On also ran an ongoing lottery would provide offerings for one of the shrines, and would tell your fortune, all for a price. Take a moment to scan through the unique items from a bygone era. An examination room by day, the large room you are standing in was transformed at night into the center of the Chinese community in John Day. After closing the general store, Long On became a casino owner as residents of both Chinatown and John Day gathered for card games, dice, dominoes, and fantan. A sign of their success, Cam Wa Chang was also one of the first buildings in John Day with electric lights and a radio. But traditional music must have been integral if you notice the Chinese violin or air gu hanging on the wall. In addition to all his other business ventures, the well-educated and multilingual Lung On also helped the residents of Chinatown by serving as a labor negotiator, often drafting contracts and serving as a translator with the local employers and landowners. He would also, for a fee, write letters for his fellow countrymen who were less educated and unable to write home. And for those nights when games weren't on the menu, he also supplied a diverse library. Any questions about this area? No, but I, I understand that uh, Lung An was also the first dealer, car dealer, in uh, John Day. Yeah, he was, yep. And the first car use salesman. And... 
all kinds of stuff going on. Yeah, it sounds like it was a pretty good uh, partnership between these two gentlemen. Yeah, they worked well together. Even though there's accounts that they sometimes will get upset at you, each other because Lang Ah being the gambling person, he would gamble away all their money, and so Doc K would yell at him for doing all that. But he'd make it back somehow. So one other thing before we move on to the kitchen is that you can't see it from this perspective here. But we actually have crates and boxes in the back storage room that are not marked. They've never been opened. So we still have no idea what's some in some of these things. And in fact, what you see here in the building is only about half of what was actually in here because we have the rest of it in the creation room. So there's a lot of crates and boxes and packages that are were open. Some of them have not been, um, but that were just stacked here in the middle of the floor. So what you see is only a portion of what was actually in the building. Any other questions? No. The only thing I could think of is the Chinese delegation really must have been slavitating and Well they were yeah. well when their original purpose was to come over here, see what Canada Chung and do a little bit of research. They didn't get that far because by the time they opened up that door and they walked in here, they were like every other tourist. They were just like all over the place, just going bonkers of what was actually here. They couldn't even concentrate on what was inside the apothecary. They were so excited with everything else. And so they, they flew all the way from China for a four hour visit. And then they flew back. So they wanted to come back a few more times. Well, yeah. Hmm. All right, we'll check out the kitchen next. We take turns cooking, but Doc K is the one feeding the men who come to stay. We make food from home, but some would rather eat food from the West. There's always a meal at Ken Wa Chang, and there's always a place to sleep. Welcome to the kitchen at Cam Wa Chang. If you were a guest here at Cam Wa Chang, chances are Doc K or Lung An would serve you from the large wok, pots, and pans. But unlike many frontier kitchens of the time, there are some unique details. If you see the small window behind the table, look for the wooden cupboard beside it. This was an early refrigerator that took advantage of the cool, dry air here in John Day. What's more, if you look down at the floor, right there is an you. indented wood square set beside the stove. This solid piece of hardwood extends all the way down to ground level and was an indoor chopping block for the wood-fired stove. This not only allowed everyone to stay in the relative safety of the building, it also kept them from the restless spirits they believed came out at night. As you look around, you'll see an interesting array of items. Doc Hay and Lung An had foods like tea, rice, and soy sauce sent from China, but were also fond of Western products like peanut butter, Coca-Cola, and even their Wheaties. And like other rooms here, there is an altar behind the stove. This one, though, is to Zhao Shen, the kitchen god. According to legend, Zhao Shen would report each year to the Jade Emperor on the state of each household but offerings of honey and other delicacies would sweeten his reports when he got to the palace. Any questions about the kitchen before going on to the bunks? No, this is fascinating. <laughs> well, I'm sure. And this was the guest quarters here? It was. It's kind of like the bed and breakfast of Camel Chung. It's like how I like to think about it. So one other neat little thing to point out is they, we believe sometime in the 1880s they dug uh, their own water well underneath the building and put a hand pump in, which ties into the chopping block. So they mainly did it for two reasons. First off, those are spirits at night. They did not want to go outside if in the dark any more than they had to. Second reason, if there was an uprising by the town folks or the miners, they'd come they'd make people into the building as they could, lock the door, and they would have their own water supply for several days at a time, if they need be. Which probably makes it one of the first buildings in John Day that they were plumbing, such as this. Okay, we'll 
check out the bunks next. I noticed the chamber pot in his area. Oh, yeah. Many arrived in Chinatown with nowhere to stay. The four bunks behind you could be rented for five cents a night. Unfortunately, with up to four people per bed, it made for some pretty cramped quarters. During the day, the bunk area would have likely been used as a private area to relax and smoke opium. Ever the entrepreneur, Long On ran a mail order business and plastered the walls and ceilings of the bunk area with pages from the catalogs so that reclining guests could peruse the pages of items for sale. As mining in the area began to slow and the Chinese laborers left John Day, Doc Hay would have used the bunk area for his patients, many of whom traveled from as far away as Utah, Nevada, and Idaho, and would have been in need of a place to rest. We're in the old thing to point out. If you look on the bottom of the bed here, there's more pages to the catalog. That way when you woke up in the morning, you knew what you wanted to buy. Jesus kind of reminds me of my bunk in the Marine Corps, <laughs> except it wasn't catalogs. <laughs> Any questions about this area at all? No, it's just uh, very, very interesting. And they had a little desk over here. Yeah, in, in, in some of the drawers there's like little sewing kits. And Everything like you would expect at a regular motel. Right. It's kind of set up that way. All right, we'll come back here and check out Long Oz's bedroom next. And watch your head here. Watch your head, sweet. Well, you don't yeah, have to watch your head. Watching. Actually, believe it or not, I can film it here. He plays cards all night somewhere, but he always returns. I'm glad he has his own door, so he doesn't wake me. The last room at Cam Wachang is Long An's bedroom. A later addition to the building, this room was found with extreme water damage after years of neglect and has been rebuilt to its original condition. Long On's business ventures were not limited to those within the walls of the building itself. Ever the capitalist, he owned the first car dealership in Eastern Oregon, ran a service station, invested in the stock market, purchased large tracts of land and mining interests throughout Oregon and Washington, owned racehorses, and when Ken Wa Chung was undergoing renovation, some of the bootleg liquor he sold during Prohibition was found beneath the floorboards of the general store. Also notice that with the exception of the front door, Long An's bedroom has the only other entrances to the building. Unlike the less fluent Doc Hay, Long An spoke perfect English and was known to socialize throughout the region, often gambling until late at night. And this extra door probably meant he wouldn't wake up Doc Hay when he did finally come home. Long An died after 52 years at Cam Wa Chung, and in his will, left his share of the business to Doc Hay, who continued to live in the building until 1948. Around 1952, shortly after Doc Hay's death, the building was closed and remained locked in time until opened in the late 1960s. Almost 80 years after they first moved in, Cam Wa Chung remained alive with the stories of Lung An and Doc Hay, perfectly preserved as a monument to the men who traveled from China, faced racial persecution, and built businesses and relationships with the residents of John Day. As members of this community, the regard with which they were held is evident in that they are the only two Chinese Americans from the Gold Rush era buried in the town cemetery, right here in John Day. And to add to that last point, Doc Hay was offered membership in the Masonic Lodge, of which he accepted, and when his remains were brought back from Portland, he had Masonic burial service here as well. So that wraps up the audio portion of the tour. 
So before we head out the back door here, there's a few closing pieces of information that kind of ties everything together. Any questions before I get into that? No, I wonder if he had any lady friends that ever visited him here. Oh, I'm sure there's quite a few. We actually have photographs of some of the women that uh, visited the Long Island and Doc Hay both. And they also had the, the YE peanut butter kisses. They handed that out to all the kids and all their women folks, friends, that they would come in. So, not unexpected to have that happen. So, to start wrapping up, yeah. Is both of these doors go out? Eventually, yeah. Um, that one's to the outside, and there is another entrance to the outside from this room in here. Historically, this was the uh, another storage room, like a receiving room for them. And currently, we use it as a mechanical room for, for suppression and security and sure. things of that sort. So to start wrapping things up, in 1940, that is when Lungan passed away. When he passed on, he was 78 years old at the time, and he left everything to Doc Hay. About a year or so after his death, a relative of Doc Hay by the name of Bob Waugh comes into the picture, and he actually moved in with his family for about two or three years, and practiced medicine with Doc Hay. And then they eventually moved across the parking lot into the house that's right over there. When he did, he took all Lungan's furnishings and belongings with him. That's why we have very little of Lungan's stuff here in the room. In 1952, when uh, Doc Hay passed away in Portland, he was actually 89 years old. And he left a will, leaving everything to his daughter. Both Doc Hay and Lungan both had wives, both had children, living in China the entire time they were here in the U.S. And the last time we think they saw their families was actually maybe around 1882. And with only just a few letters of correspondence um, after that point. In the 1950s, they did try to locate the family members. However, because the U.S. China relations at the time not being that great, they had a hard time tracking anyone down. So eventually, through the court process, it was awarded back to Bob Waugh, who was still living here. In 1958, um, Bob Waugh wrote out a deed giving the property and the estate to the city of John Day. With the stipulation, it be kept as a museum in testaments of the Chinese immigrants to the U.S. However, at the beginning of the tour, if you recall, I said the city was going to tear the building down. That's because they actually forgot they owned the property. And they didn't realize it until they started going through the process of making a museum, rediscovered the documents, and said, see, we fulfilled his request and made it a museum. A little bit after the fact, but yes, it did happen like that. So that's kind of in a nutshell the estate history. Another question that we get quite often is about the second floor of the building. Um, we believe it was completed in the late 1890s, which corresponds to the completion of the Period City Railroad. Everyone thought there was going to be another big mining boom, so they were getting ready for that, including Long On. He wanted to add more bunk space, so he went around town, found the house, hoisted it up on top, and there's your second floor. He never did use it for lodging, but he did use it for extra story space. In fact, most of our documents in the collection came from the second floor up there as well. A couple other points to leave you with is that um, in April, I was actually contacted by the Chamber of Commerce. They wanted to know which village Doc Hay actually came from. And so, through some research, we found out that it's called Ha Pen. It's in China, kind of south and west of Hong Kong. Well, the reason why the Chamber wanted to know that, because they went to the city council to propose a sister city with that village. And um, everything seemed like it went through, so we are now officially sister cities with Ha Pen Village in China. Which, with that, comes with all the cultural exchanges, which I will be taking advantage of. Because in the spring, I will be sending a genealogist over to China to see if they can not get documentation and information about that case. And hopefully a little bit of what's going on here as well. So we'll see how that all comes about. Uh, one other thing to leave you with is they talked about the boot like whiskey they fire underneath the floorboards. And in the walls, and in the ceilings, any place a bottle could be found. So what we were thinking was happening with that is Lingan knew about Prohibition coming. So we bought crates of it before it happened. And he hid it throughout the building here. In fact, we even found the cash for these bottles in the yard just to the south of the building here as well. Well, in the 1920s, he was arrested for bootlegging. However, they had to let him go for a lack of evidence. They only found two bottles. 
In the 1970s, during their first round of renovations, when they opened up everything, they found a few more bottles, about 98 of them. They took them out and put them into storage. In 2005, when State Parks takes over operations, they brought back some of the bottles. Because apparently, in the 1970s, in celebration of it becoming a museum, they opened up a few bottles and gave away a couple hours of gifts and souvenirs. So we now have 33 of the original 98 bottles. They are still all sealed. They are stamped brewed 1913, marketed 1917. And we have them appraised about four years ago and they're each worth about $10,000 a piece today. So if you want to see what brands they are, I have a couple bottles if you haven't seen them already in the Interpretive Center over there. But they're basically four different brands of Kentucky bourbon. So if you're doing construction someday and you're tearing the walls down from a little building and find these bottles, now you know how much they're worth. And with that, that concludes the tour, unless you got more questions. No, I think you've covered everything more than adequately. <laughs> Good. Good. Yeah. Here, let me uh, stop it here.